Great. Uh, I'm going to apologize on the front end. As I've been doing tons of talks lately, and usually they're like 45 minutes to an hour and a half long, you know. And so this is like a 15-minute a little, little mini talk for me. And so I'm going to rush through things. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some things that people want me to talk more about. I'm also going to say from the beginning is I'm just going to talk about what I know and what I do. I'm not necessarily... Uh, I don't know it all, uh, and I'm probably not even the most experienced person on this chat or on this uh, Zoom meeting right now. So that's why I'm really excited about being here. So I want to learn from all of you uh, as well. Uh, as Stephanie said, I'm the, John Kay. I'm the Director of Traditional Arts Indiana Statewide Folk Arts Program. And we work with all different type of artists, whether it's a uh, fourth generation rag rug weaver, Dee Nierman from down in in Brownstown that keeps a family craft, a handicraft that's been in her family. She works on the same loom that her great-great-great-grandmother great worked on at the time of the Civil War. Uh, to old-time fiddlers like uh, Archie Kraut from over in uh, Park County. Uh, and, and then we're also not just working with some of those older arts, but we're working with arts that are, that are constantly being brought here, whether we're look, talking about Menjit Singh, a great uh, tabla and harmoni harmonium player, or we're talking about Sung Min, uh, a, a chin weaver from the Southport area. There are wonderful traditional arts that are, that are constantly being brought here. Now, this project is not just about the traditional arts, but I wanted to throw the folk and traditional arts out there because I think they're really interesting because they provide a way for us not just to think about art with a capital A, but art as in a practice. Uh, this is my friend, Junie Theo Harris. She passed away a few years ago, but she ran the, the Venus Chocolate Shop up in Elwood, Indiana. Uh, and she, every day, would make chocolate, and she would interact with people that would come into her shop. And she creatively aged up into her late 70s, uh, uh, her whole life. She kept the shop just basically as a way to connect with her community and to fulfill that kind of creative urge uh, and meaningful practice that she, uh, that she has. As my friend John Schoolman uh, told me many, many years ago, John lived to be 100 years old, and he was creatively active all the way to the very end. Uh, he made these just get out of town, colorful walking sticks. Uh, and he said, it keeps my mind busy. It keeps me going. Arts can be a thing that give us purpose and meaning uh, as we age in life. And we're going to talk more uh, about, uh, about that in, in just a second. Indiana, uh, unfortunately, has been ranked, uh, I think uh, last year the, the numbers came in and were 42 out of 50 states in the health and well-being of older adults. You combine with the, that fact that uh, for the first time in human history, people over the age of 65 outnumber the people under the age of five for the first time ever. Uh, and that number is, uh, over the next 15 years, is going to skyrocket. Uh, we're living in a time where people are getting uh, living much longer and our communities are getting much older. Uh, uh, unfortunately, many of the artists I work with, fortunately, are, are, are happily engaged. They have a community around them. Uh, the traditional arts provide that for many of them. But many older adults in Indiana suffer from what uh, uh, Dr. Bill Thomas, a uh, ger uh, gerontologist, calls uh, the three plagues. That's the problems of feelings of isolation, being cut off from people, feelings of loneliness, uh, also feelings of boredom, endlessly watching TV, endlessly playing cr uh, Candy Crush on their phone, uh, feeling cut off uh, from people uh, so that it ends up having, feeling like they don't have something that they can do. Uh, and that ultimately leads to feelings of helplessness. Uh, and that tends to make us feel even more frail, that we feel like we're not, uh, we're not connected uh, and we don't, we don't have uh, control over our world any longer. Uh, and I think that this is really horrible that so many older adults experience these, these three problems. Uh, but I think, I'm, I'm gonna say it from the front, I don't think that art is going to cure cancer. I don't think that it's going to be the silver bullet for all the all that ails us uh, in this world. But I have seen over and over again how the arts improve the quality of life of older adults, their well-being uh, in general. 
Uh, people like my friend Bob Taylor works for months on a, on a carving uh, that he then can take to the local county fair or he can show uh, at the wood carving club. Uh, and it's all about creating something when you're alone so you can engage with people later. So you're not just about making, but it's that sharing that is built into it. Whether we're talking about wood carving or we're talking about quilt makers, social engagement, being able to connect with a group, but also to connect one on one is one of the strengths that arts provide to our older adults. Uh, this is my friend, Kathy Rucker. Uh, I came to know her at the Indiana State Fair. She actually coordinates several dance classes throughout Indianapolis. Probably some of you all uh, know Kathy. A and I made uh, a couple of uh, short little documentary uh, clips uh, that I wanted to share with you. And she really talks about the power of sociability uh, in, the, in teaching dance. So I wanted to share that uh, with you. And so I created the Still Kitchen Fathers. And um, they're all 55 years of age and older. Um, and some people don't start till they're 60 or 70, or whatever. Uh, most of them start dancing after they've retired. Um, you don't have kids, you don't have to worry about going to work the next morning and you can't get out of bed because you've vlogged all evening. You know? <laughs> so, and it's, and so many people are, widowed and and so many people's family uh, you know they don't have family anymore and and so it it's a place to go where you meet new friends and you can always find somebody to go out and eat with uh, somebody that will come over and practice dancing uh, so basically that's how they got started it's just so the other group that um... Uh, that Kathy works with is the, the Heritage Place uh, Ladies of the Dance up in uh, on the north side of Indianapolis. Uh, but first about the still kicking cloggers. I think that uh, uh, Kathy's point is it gives a social network for people. We have become more and more abstracted from families as people, people move away. Uh, family, children, grandchildren are not close by for many older adults any longer. Uh, and so having... Uh, having these types of activities provide a good network of friends that maybe one time your work life provided for you, but as you retire, you have to make new friends uh, again. Uh, and so I think you see the same thing, but I'm gonna let someone who has experienced this talk to you about what um, uh, being a part of the Heritage Place Ladies of the Dance did for, um, for Odessa Higginson. I'm 92 years old and I love dancing, and I intend to keep dancing as long as I can keep moving. Oh, but it is, it's, it's a great group, and it's a great way to get your exercise in. It's a great way to make friends. It's a great way to socialize, because the older you get, the more you need to try to keep moving, keep socializing. Don't sit at home looking at the television and nothing on it, no way. So. And this is just my way of life. And that's one of the other things that I've seen over and over again with people who do these uh, these creative practices. Sometimes they don't pick them up until they reach that retirement age, but it becomes almost self-defining for them. It gives them purpose, it gives them meaning, it gives them connections to other people. It becomes, as Odessa said, their way of life and it becomes something that really uh, ends up centering them in that, whether it's uh, quilt making like my friend, Amelia Colfer. Uh, she's part of the of the the Sisters of the Cloth Quilting Guild way up in Fort Wayne, uh, but she's also taken on uh, Andrea Faust. Her niece is an apprentice and she's teaching quilt making to her. So the social engagement of a group, but also one-on-one -on -one friendships and partnerships and ways of connecting, reconnecting or deepening connections with, uh, with families also comes from the arts. Remember the other plague that we talked about was this idea of uh, helplessness. Uh, art making can give us the sense of mastery. My friend uh, 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 James Jan uh, from down in Bloomington did calligraphy, played Urhu, uh, lots of uh, other traditional arts. 
And it became a, a practice for him, much like a meditative practice for him, the engaging in these art forms. And that's why we talk about an artistic practice. It's not about making art the thing, but art as a process and paying attention to that creative process is really important when we're talking about our arts activity. Picking things that you can do throughout your life. Keith Rubel, a friend of mine that hews these bulls, is a great proponent for the idea of having arts in everyday life, but also arts that are something that you're not going to age out of, that you're not all of a sudden no longer able to play basketball or no longer able to do something, but something that you can keep doing at each stage, uh, kind of throughout the whole life cycle. Uh, arts also become a valuable way of building resilience. When you're making something, uh, this is my friend Jenny Kander, who makes these beautiful dolls. She also makes collage. Uh, she do, writes poetry. Uh, and it becomes a form of resilience for, for people. Uh, resilience, it's having all of these resources that you can pull together that when bad things happen, you can hold on to them and can maintain your sense of self. This is uh, Mary Alice Collins, a champion pie baker. She was uh, on The View, the talk show, uh, champion for that one thousands, literally thousands of uh, ribbons uh, from the county fair, state fair, and, and other contests. Um, she got sick a few years ago, got sepsis in her hands, lost all the fingers on her hands, lost both knees below her legs. Uh, they thought that she was going to die. Uh, that happened in the winter months. Uh, she was diagnosed with cancer over the summer. Uh, but come August, when the Indiana State Fair happened, she entered dozens of pies in the Indiana State Fair. Why was that? She was communicating to herself that she could do this, that she was still the same person. Her art making, making pies, became that thing that held her life together a way for her to work with her husband uh, and like she always had in doing this. Being able to have that thing that when everything else is falling apart that you can go to because it's part of who you are uh, is really important. And I could talk about lots of the public programs. I saw Lydia Campbell Mayer on here. She's helped with a lot of the programs that we've done with Traditional Arts Indiana. Uh, but we've done things like uh, memory painting workshops. Uh, ideally, art workshops, and we're going to talk about this in some of them, are, are sequential in the way that they're, they're happening. So we did that with uh, uh, the Silver Strings Group down in Washington County. We, uh, Kara Barnard, a great uh, musician, uh, has been going around different communities in Indiana, and we've been working with her to teach dulcimer playing. And I thought, real quickly, I'm going to share a little documentary clip for you about that. Um, I've always loved music my whole life, never had the time to pursue it. And I just want to say that it has already majorly improved the quality of my life. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Marta Anderson, and my husband Rick and I, I came to the Dulcimer class. It gave us something to do together. We just recently retired, and it's just really been it's something we want to continue. So it's really been great. I came here with a friend because we thought it would be fun. But I think I found my instrument for my lifetime. I love it. And it was easy. Kara was a great teacher. Um, and I am going to continue it. We're going to meet as a group and maybe do some gigs. So I'm excited. It's a new part of life. I know our first class, we started looking at the music everything. Just sort of a light, little light went off in my head like, yeah. Um, so it's great to get out of the house and use a different part of my brain. and. Uh, never played a string instrument before and it's uh, it's simple enough to be simple but I think it's uh, advanced enough to you know there's a, a place to keep going and it's uh, nice to meet with a bunch of people I, I, I didn't know anybody in this class um, I love playing the dulcimer it's relaxing um, the lessons here have just been phenomenal Kara is awesome and uh, it gives you um, a purpose as you get older and just really enjoy it. Recommend it for anyone. So there you can see that it, we're not just talking, sometimes when we say the word creative aging, people think of uh, people with dementia, people with Alzheimer's, people in nursing homes. We're actually talking about just a way of being in the world, that we're talking about people throughout that life cycle 
that we're all, if we're lucky enough, we're going to hopefully live to be an advanced age, but sometimes we have to start investing in those things even earlier. Um, and so having creative practice is really important. Um, but lots of people get to retirement and they don't have something and they're looking for something. And so our workshops and classes can be a resource for them to kind of connect them with a community of people. Uh, one of the other activities that we've been uh, doing are these arts and aging summits, creative aging summits, uh, where we basically invite in community members to older adults to share what they make, kind of like we did at the very beginning here. And the thing that becomes really apparent in this is that the art is intended not just to be art, but art is meant to be shared. And people love talking about this. And at these sessions, the microphone goes around and I ask people, they show us their work and they talk about it, but then I ask follow-up questions about who do you make these for? Uh, how does it make you feel when you make these things? Kind of things that kind of foreground those three plagues that we were talking about and how they've come up with their own system of dealing with the, the isolation, boredom, and helplessness that beset so many older adults. Well, I could talk about all the all the work that we do, but I want, real quickly just want to share with you. Uh, we have created a free resource guide uh, that you can download in this PDF. Uh, you don't have to write this down. We're going to share all of this with you all uh, so you can get that. But uh, it's a free 80 page uh, booklet. Uh, Lydia that I mentioned before, she helped out uh, with the writing of this. Uh, you can get both a free digital copy, but you can also if you sign up, we'll mail you a copy of, uh, of the Memory Art and Aging Guide as well. Uh, and the guide includes profiles of these kind of inspiring elders and then activities that older adults can do uh, on their own, but also there are also uh, options for them to be able to use them uh, in group settings. So it makes them useful in, in more facility type settings. Uh, I'm also the author of a, of a couple of books, uh, Folk Art and Aging, which is a book about uh, the uh, my first book about arts and, and later life. Uh, and you can get a free uh, PDF copy of that from this link. And you also can get the edited volume that I did, The Expressive Lives of Elders. And then I'm going to ask Stephanie to tell you about these national sources. So I kind of stayed on my timetable here, I think. Thanks, John. Um, well, we know we're kind of preaching to the choir in this setting and this meeting. You all are here because you support this sort of thing. But I, I love seeing it nonetheless. I've seen John's presentation before and I still uh, get chills when he talks about different artists. Uh, if you would just share what's resonating with you from uh, what John just shared in the chat, uh, tell me a word, something that's sticking with you from that presentation. What do you, what's it generating? What ideas are popping up for you? Um, if you want to put a word or two into the chat and let me know what you're thinking, or if you want to unmute yourself and, and say something, a word or two. Okay, great. Resilience, life cycles throughout all the life cycles. Ooh, I like Go ahead. I like the heirlooms, uh, the idea of generativity that's kind of caring for the next generation. I could have done a whole thing just about that, uh, having something to pass on. Mm -hmm. Community, heritage, lifelong friendships. That's all great stuff. Giving. Uh, connected. I, I, those two words, giving and connectedness, go together. You know, you, you become connected through our gifts that we give people, and that's sharing ourselves. So that's, that's really important. Don't think of art as a thing, but as a process. Love that. So glad someone picked up on that. I'm the first that will say, I'm agnostic about good art. I just like art. Uh, I, I like the fact, I think so many people have been discouraged by not by being told that their art isn't good, that we we all want to be make better stuff, but it, start, it starts by people making stuff or doing things or being active. The, what art does in us is just as important as what art looks like. 
Yeah, and like I said, we know we're preaching to the choir here. Many of you already work with older adults and you know uh, some of the statistics that Indiana has a growing uh, older population and that it's important that we engage with them. So um, thank you for being here. And I hope that this creative aging conversation just gives you another tool in your toolkit uh, on how to uh, support the older adults in your life. Um, the last slide that John had um, was about the national connections that we are utilizing. There is, it's okay, John. We will send out links as I put, as I said in the chat, we'll send out all the links and stuff later. But what I wanted to mention as we start talking about what are we doing in Indiana? So now we know the backstory about why creative aging is impactful and, and what it is and all the big things that this kind of making can include. What are we doing here in Indiana? Well, uh, what I want to say is there are some national um, organizations, national research that creative aging has been around as a concept, connecting arts and aging formally uh, has been around for a while. And, and these national groups are exploring that uh, research and the, the impact on older adults. So if you want to really dive into the world of creative aging as far as a formal field, uh, look to the National Guild for Community Arts Education. Uh, Time Slips is an organization, um, I think in Minnesota by Ann Basings. It is, a, uh, it is memory care and theater. And then Lifetime Arts is an organization we'll be working with uh, based out of New York, who's done a ton of programs uh, across the country on preparing artists to work with older adults specifically. So. There's just a few organizations that are doing similar work in creative aging if you want to dive in. And then, thank you, John, I'm going to switch to talk about Indiana. So what are we doing in Indiana now that we know creative aging is important? We've always known that, but the Indiana Arts Commission is the state agency for the arts in Indiana, and we have got gotten a small amount of funding to start this initiative in creative aging here in Indiana. And really the goal of this funding is to start this conversation between uh, aging communities, uh, people who are older, between providers, people who are service providers for the aging community, and between artists and arts organizations. We want to start everyone getting more connected so that we can ultimately support older citizens in Indiana. So what we're doing with this funding, we're calling it Lifetime Lifelong Arts. Oh my gosh, I wrote the wrong name of the program on my own slide. It's confusing because our consulting firm is called Lifetime Arts, but this program's called Lifelong Arts Indiana. And there are some components here that I wanna share with you. Starting on the left, there's a circle and inside it says community engagement. That's what we're doing right now. We've got a few different, uh, uh, meetings, they'll all be virtual, I think, uh, meetings that we'll do to engage our community, listen to the community, we're going to talk to artists, we're going to talk to um, uh, community members who are older, and we're going to talk to service providers. We have a, a longer webinar in June that we'll be doing the full, an hour long, what is creative aging for anyone who's new that wants to learn more. And then we have, uh, starting in June, we're gonna open up applications for artists to join at the Indiana Arts Commission, kind of a learning journey. We're gonna take them on a, a series of workshops and coaching sessions to prepare them to be confident and competent in delivering arts experiences for older adults. There is a, a, some best practices in that sort of artistry for older adults that we wanna, we wanna um, equip our artists with. And that will be taking place over the second half of this year. And then looking at early 2022 is when we will be sending those artists out into communities across the state so that they can engage with older adults. They'll be partnering with uh, service providers and, and uh, organizations or sites or community centers that um, where older adults spend their time. And they'll be partnering with those organizations to do week-long or multi-week residencies for those older adults. And that's the real brief timeline of what we hope to do in Indiana, uh, equipping those artists to, to deliver the best possible experiences 
so that older adults can get involved in arts learning.